So anyway, without further ado, welcome Jack. Thank you so much, Stefan. Does everybody mind if I take my mask off? Are you guys good? All right, yeah. Oh, that's so much better. Holy cow. Well, I'm really glad to be here, you guys. You know, last year, um, obviously right before Chicago, because uh, I've been doing Zooms for, I mean, almost two years now, and everything was fantastic. I think that week, we came in on a Monday. I had 13 lectures um, by the time we left on Saturday. Uh, here's Conrad and I, Chicago, um, at the Cigar Lounge, having a great time. with Everybody was on top of the world. And then we got back from Chicago. And, and this book is, I actually think, is a perfect example of, of what we all thought of about that time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, it, was, it was pretty bad. Um, but I want to say, I've been, this is my third in-person lecture in about two months. Um, I was at Piers North America. Uh, that went really, really great. And um, that was live and in-person. I just got back from the, actually, to note, so I'm a little rusty. And uh, I hadn't tied a tie in a long time. So this one is too long, because I retied it six times. That is about five inches too short. But I just decided to go ahead and roll with it anyways. <laughs> and uh, Florida ACP was great. It was in, uh, that was in person. It's funny, when we first went to the Zooms, um, I said, that's the end of meetings. Because it, you, know, you guys to take time off of work, to come to the meeting, for you guys don't know what the manufacturer side, if you've ever seen what these guys go through to put together one of the meetings as far as the exhibitors floor and that, it's unbelievable. They'll get here a whole week early. Same thing with Chicago. Um, and so and it's a massive expense. Now fast forward all this time and um, everybody is sick of Zooms. We're human beings, we need that interaction, right? And that time you thought was just getting drunk at the bar is actually really, really important. It's the camaraderie and the relationships that we build amongst each other. So now I'm really seeing the meetings come back and everybody's really, really excited. So I think we should give our, all of ourselves a round of applause. Thank you. I'm very thankful that you're all here. And uh, in-person meetings, so it's gonna, be, it's gonna be great. That being said, I am ridiculously rusty. Okay, so I give no guarantees. Um, I've gone long. I've gone short, so this might be 30 minutes short, it might be 30 minutes long, but I'm gonna do my best because my timing, like my tie, is completely screwed up because it's been so long since I've actually done this in front of people. Let's see if I don't kind of slip over my words and, and get tongue-tied. So of course, from Absolute Dental in North Carolina, 25 years in business, uh, NADL, NADL Laboratory of the Year, I believe that was last year. Um, that's where I'm from. Also home of the Advanced Restorative Team. And today we're gonna to talk about a lot of great things. A lot of these things we'll talk about, we actually have guides on our website that you can go to. Um, you could download some of the techniques if you're wondering how I went through everything to get to that hybrid. It's all on the website, you can download them, they're all there. Um, we have everything from surgical all the way to uh, uh, restoring a hybrid from front to back, so CONUS is on there. There's all types of things. Um, you just go to the website, and you could find those on there. So we're going to talk about zirconia today. I've been talking about zirconia forever, but I put a whole bunch of different information in here, some tips, some tricks. We'll talk about myths. I still hear the same thing um, that I've always heard about zirconia. And it's funny, as, as a product, I still gotta say, it's one of the most misunderstood. And um, a lot of the old zirconia myths have still followed it today, especially in the clinical world. Um, I gave a lecture we were talking about, um, it was a Zoom, of course, uh, in the UK, maybe how many, was that about three months ago? And, and, and I'm not kidding, guys, they are honestly, a, they're years and years and years behind where we're at in the US. They're looking at zirconia and talking about the same things we were talking about seven, eight years ago. I took slides that were seven and eight years old and used them just to bring them up to speed to where we are in the States because if I just hit them with this presentation, they wouldn't even be able to start to begin to grasp it. So, you know, I still, especially I work a lot in academics with um, undergrad and postgrad residency programs. And even at the academic level, 
there's still so much mis misinformation that's out there. So we're going to talk about zirconia, the mis applications, history, green stage finishing, still everybody wants to know, and uh, sintering, and some different products out there. Myths. Is it a perfect material, and is a hybrid, a today's hybrid restoration a perfect restoration? No. It, it has some faults. What are some of the things that we know that are, that are constant? You could get screw breakage. You might get tie base loosening, things like that. When we look at something like weight, the weight one cracks me up, okay? So everybody's like, oh, it's too heavy. I can't imagine putting that in the mouth. When I hear that, I know a clinician or a technician doesn't do a lot of zirconia. You know the human head weighs 11 pounds? I have 11 pounds of meat on top of my shoulders right now. I'm not very powerful. I have noodle arms, right? And I hold it up. You don't see me walking around like this, dragging my head like on the ground. It's the same thing with the zirconia. When you put that in and it's in the implants, the patients aren't noticing. They're not walking around with their their heads like this, silly. It's just, it really, really is silly. They're coming out with new lightweight materials, right? That will probably break, or that will probably fail, or that'll probably wear. So weight, to me, I say weight's a non-issue. Clacking, clacking is an interesting one, because this one comes up. Um, when I talk to clinicians, I always talk to them about it this way. First of all, let's look at how many people have done opposing arches, like say three unit bridges opposing each other in zirconia, right? Huh? Does anybody complain about clacking? So what's the difference if you put double jaw zerk in? Same thing, I do full mouth rehabs in, let's say single units, right? No implants, all singles. I'll do a double jaw and zerk. Nobody walks around and complains about clacking. It's only when we talk about hybrid. Clacking can also be caused, this is very interesting though, if a patient is over opened. So that's something you wanna watch. So other than normal sounds in the mouth, if they're over open, they're gonna hit early and prematurely and you're gonna hear it click, 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 click. That's because the bite is over. So it's very, very important that you wanna make sure that that vertical and the bite is correct because that can happen. Um, too opaque, we just know it's not true. Um, not with the modern zirconia, especially that Argon has. Um, that's way, way in the past. Um, and I tell everybody from single centrals to full arch hybrids, that's what I use it for. We're going to see a lot of that today. Fracture prone? Could be. Depends how you made it, depends how you treated it. I always tell everybody zirconia is like a common sense material. Treat it with respect, like ladies, and it will be very nice and kind to you. Don't and see what happens, right? So there's a lot of different things that go in there. What are some things that anybody, anybody hear anything about zirconia? When you're talking to a clinician, he's, oh, I don't want zirconia. What's his reason? Anybody? Anything good? Bonding, ah. good one, very good one. So I can tell you that I do a lot of zirconia veneers right now. I do a lot of zirconia single wing Maryland bridge. Double wing I've had debonding, single wing I've had success. And I was just talking about this because there's a whole bunch of studies going on about getting a bond. I've even seen a zirconia etch that's out there. And they're working on it. And they're saying that they're getting bonding, the clinicians who are like the superstar brains in the academic world that are working on these research studies. They're getting bonding. It's just a different type of bonding than conventionally thought, right? But it's, it's working. And what I tell everybody when a clinician asks me, I say from a commercial aspect, as a producer, right, that you might see one case a day I'll see, you know, 500. Um, I can tell you it's working because I'm not getting them back. But other than that, that is, the, and there are people working on it. I don't have any definitive answers for that yet, uh, but it is, in, it is in progress. And I can tell you, I would assume within the next year, um, on the clinical side, once the data and the literature starts being released, you're gonna see more and more people moving to zirconia veneers. History of zirconia, this is kind of interesting. I used a lot of these slides for the UK and I started some of these techniques way, 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 way back when me and Jeff were just, you know, dreaming about this stuff. But that's where we all started out. Um, it came in one shade. It was just white. And then we would do all the external staining. And, you know, came up with cutback techniques that kind of look like this. These slides are really, really old. You guys might have seen these years ago. Uh, but I kind of threw them in here to show kind of the progression of where we're at today. I thought my battery almost died. Um, you know, same thing with anteriors, keeping that in size a ledge. I used to tell everybody you don't get anything by removing it. Go ahead and keep it. That way you protect the restoration. You definitely don't want to take it off. Same here. You can see that cut back, just layering a little bit of incisal. And we used to layer the zirconia 
because we had to, okay? That's gonna come up later when I'm talking about not layering. Used to layer back then. Now, if I layer today, I'm not getting any better result than I would if I'm doing monolithic. I did it back then because I had to, because at that time it was just kind of really opaque. And all different things like this, I used to use the different zerlining paste to go ahead and put some, you know, different colors in there and come back and layer it. And I would get those effects. That incisal edge is completely supported by zirconia. That was my point, and you don't have to remove it. If you're going to layer it, if you really like layering, really, really like it, then go ahead and do it. Just don't take the incisal edge off. I, this is crazy, I'm a ceramist, you guys know that. I hate layering porcelain, hate it. That's why I got so fast at it. And it wasn't how you applied the porcelain or how many porcelains you applied, it's how you applied them kind of deal, uh, just because I hated layering that much. And you know, cases like this, when we talk about weight, this case I did with uh, the late Dr. Carl Misch, and um, back then, he would only do high noble alloy for his cases, and we would layer them. So you want to talk about weight? I think I threw three and a half ounces of alloy at that and maybe barely had a button. Um, so it's, it's funny when everybody's like, oh, zirconia is too heavy. What's, what's too heavy compared to the you know, four pounds of high noble in this patient's mouth? So I mean, that's, that's, it, it just doesn't make sense. So think about that when you hear if somebody's talking about zirconia being heavy. Just use that as a reminder. And this is where we were. I was uh, doing those hybrid layering techniques on um, zirconia hybrids back then, again, because I had to not because I wanted to. This was an early on version of full contour zirconia in the anterior. Um, I believe this was actually 3Y. And they said don't do it, so I went ahead and did it anyways. Um, that's kind of what I do. And what you guys are gonna see in, in some of these slides is, is as we go on, um, this is really, not to get all mushy and emotional on you guys, uh, but this is like my life's work for the last 20 years, and I'm glad to say we're actually there right now with the materials we have, with the modern day zirconia, and with the support materials, we're able to get to that point to where we can create monolithic restorations. There are all the benefits of having a restoration monolithic, from the design to prototyping to keeping that information flowing through. Um, and we don't have to worry about going back and layering it. And there's some reasons why we'll talk about that that's very important. But I can say, I mean, I can say, truthfully to all you guys right now, that we're there right now. It's really, really exciting because the benefit is all of ours, right? And the benefit is the clinicians and the benefit is the patients. So the advanced restorative team at Absolute, I started this when I first got there. I do a lot in prosthodontics. Um, and prosthodontics is its own. Uh, the first time when I was a young technician and I got into prosthodontics, I said a tooth is a tooth. There's no such thing as prosthodontics. I learned incredibly the hard way uh, immediately after that and after getting my butt kicked for years, finally started to figure it out. But that's where all of my cases come through and that's the technicians that work on my cases with me or alongside of me. And that's where we do not layer. And I just hired, as you guys know, the three best ceramists in the biz because these guys do all of my layering for me. I don't have to layer anything, okay? They've already done it. And that's why we're able to do everything monolithically. That's pretty good photos, huh? My clicker's not working. With the STML, the STML is primarily my go-to um, for all of my anterior aesthetic cases, things like that, even in the posterior. Um, big cases could be three unit bridges, single centrals. I get this all the time. Do I do single centrals in STML monolithic? Yes, absolutely, positively, okay? This gives me my base shade. This is where I start out. These guys, as you just seen, the three best ceramists in the world, they're the ones that did the layering for me. We're going to look at a couple cases, and I got some new ones in here. I have some old ones. Believe it or not, it is as hard for me to get post-op photos as it is for you guys. They all say that case was unbelievable. I'm going to take pictures and send them to you, and then, yeah, they don't. Uh, but I literally, I was making slides this morning because I begged and pleaded with somebody to send me a case that they just delivered, and I, they actually did. So I had to put it in here. Um, again, single central, no problem. 
Um, that's a result that I would take all day long. And you know, when you're looking at it, you're taking all the same skills you have as a ceramist and just applying it to you know, the monolithic design. Dr. Chris Barwich at the University of Iowa, kind of pre-op, post-op. Again, completely monolithic. That's, you know what, that's when I say when my life's work is complete, that's where we're at today. That's what we can do. Is it perfect? No. At the polarized photo. Ah, you want to know what? But I'll still take it. He thought it was great. I didn't have to layer it. Uh, this case I've showed for a while. This was one of the early cases that I did in ML. Uh, really tough case. You have custom abutment in number eight. We're going to have prep on number nine. Oh, by the way, it has a big metal post and core. That case right there, that sucks, right? And when you get that, you're like, what am I going to do with this thing? Um, you know, and super translucent, beautiful tooth. We'll go ahead and do our design. On this case, I actually used the white plus because our zirconia is so translucent now. It has lost the masking ability. That's fine. I don't want it. I could add it. This is an ability that zirconia has over a material like lithium disilicate. You cannot, you cannot opacify lithium disilicate at will, but you can zirconia in a pre-sinter application. And that's how I'm going to block out the custom abutments. When you design something like this, if you did a prototype try-in and it came out and then you cut it all back, then you have to put it all back on. That's where we get information lost. And for years in prosthodontics, especially when it comes to layering, you would do all of this wax plastic, glass, right? You would do all this work up, diagnostic wax up, and then you would get to the end, and then you'd have to, you're making matrices, and you're making sure you're building your ceramic in the matrix. We don't have to worry about that no more, not with monolithic, because you're designing it and keeping all of that information. So this is the case with Dr. Chris Barwich, um, congenitally missing laterals, young girl, awesome surface textures. Here's his design, and he's gonna do his design for his surgical guide, okay? And he did this. Dr. Barwich is an awesome, awesome clinician. He's at the University of Iowa. He's now the head of that program there. He just took that position. And here are his provisionals. Not bad. He did a pretty good job. That's what I told him. But that's what we're going to do. So you've got implants in 7 and 10. It's going to be screw retained. I don't have all the rest of the photos for this because obviously I just put the slides together today and I have more to get. But I wanted to show you guys this result because it was very, very exciting. Note the surface texture anatomy. Let's talk about that. When I do an anterior case, if it's going to be a single central, let's say a single central, I look at it for 20 seconds. The first three things that pop into my mind are what I go ahead and copy. I don't stare at it and 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 lose my mind staring at it. I look at it, I see it, three seconds, I'm out of there. And then I'll go ahead and apply the first, number one everybody's seeing is, the, I mean the teeth are beautiful, but it's the surface texture and the anatomy that's on there that's really catching your eye. So we have to make sure that we incorporate that into our restorations. And there you have it. That's monolithic STML, screw retained on custom abutments, mind you. And the real thing that's just driving Dr. Barwich nuts, um, doesn't bother me, but it's driving him nuts, is he had some tissue creep right there, right there. Otherwise, this, I mean, look at, we still maintained our papillas right there and there, but right there it crept on him. Um, if you can argue me a reason that you should still layer, I would love to hear it. All right, shoot. What do you mean you can't wait? Ah, we're going to get to that. We're going to get to that. So <laughs> that's a good one. That's a good one. I was, I was ready. Look at Did you see I was ready? I was like, let's do this. You can't, you can't beat that. And that's where we're at today, guys. And that's what's so, so exciting. It also, in the laboratory, I mean, it gives us, there's so many benefits of doing something full contour or doing something monolithic. We can get the aesthetics, okay, so we could check that box. Um, time, that's really nice, okay, some time savings in there. I don't like the layer, so I don't have to do it anymore. Um, there's, there's a lot of benefits to being able to do it like this. Prototyping, you're being able to maintain all of that information all the way through the end. And there he is. And the art team, want to know the best thing about this case? Is I didn't make the whole entire thing. How about that? How about Jack has more time to come and spend with you guys today because I got the art team back there. I contoured them in the green stage. 
Okay, I applied the surface texture and anatomy. And one of my art team members, Jimmy Liu, stained and glazed them. So, and we're able to get those kind of results. It's super, super exciting. So real day-to-day -day work. That case we actually got in one shot. All right, that was a one shot, one hit wonder. It is very, very rare, even for me. I tell everybody, single centrals are educated guests. And I'm really, really tired. We have this thing in dentistry on both the clinical and technical side called dental porn. It's in every single lecture that you guys have gone to over the last 10 years. It's the single central up on the screen that the guy showed that he blasted out in five minutes and it was super, super easy and it went right in and look at that perfect match. He doesn't tell you that he remade it six times because that's the truth, right? But we all look at that. It's dental porn. Clinicians do it too. Yeah, look at I just dropped the single central and it's perfect. This should be an awesome case. This is like technicians dream stuff to do cases like this. We get all excited. And I totally missed. <laughs> I totally missed. The crazy thing about it was they loved it. They thought it was the greatest thing ever. And I begged them, please get it back to me. They're like, no, we love it. It's great. So I'm like, OK. Um, but monolithic, if I would have got that back, I would have done some things different. I had some things right, and I had some things wrong. But back to educated guess. Uh, this case was with MUSC. and. Um, Back to the clacking, this is a double jaw case, all singles. Came out like that with Dr. Wally Rene. If you don't know Dr. Wally Rene, look him up. Um, he's huge on social media, and he's huge into digital. And he just puts up some awesome, awesome stuff. Not just cases, but techniques. He does a lot with scanning. I mean, he's a wealth of knowledge, and everything is based off literature. He's very, very literature focused. There we go. So that was double jaw case, same thing, all monolithic, getting kind of boring. If you guys haven't figured it out, it's really not going to be any layering going on. Uh, full arches are cut. I would love to show you where I put out this palette like 14 powder, and then when I was done, it was still A2, but I won't, I won't bore you with that stuff. Because <laughs> that's what it used to be. At least that's how my mind used to work when I would see it. Um, I am, with you guys, very humble and honored to be here, but I am exactly what you see. I'm not going to show you something and you come to the laboratory tomorrow to come visit me on a surprise visit and you're like, hey, wait, you said you didn't. You will never find that. This is exactly what I do at the laboratory. Full face and full smile photos, digital diagnostic design. Um, when we're talking about hybrids, and it's funny, I'm not sure how we are, how many people in the room are importing photos in the three shape. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. If you're not, yeah, you should. This was one of my biggest slides in the ACP and I was absolutely blown away because it's so incredible and it's so easy to do. So let's take a look at it. What you gotta do, there's a key. There's one key. If you follow, so there's the Bellis thing, the 3D, I don't use any of that, right? The fact that the head is 3D doesn't mean anything to me. Um, I want a full face, full smile photo. I don't care for retracted photos. I get them all the time. Nobody walks around retracted. That'd be crazy, right? So I don't really have no use for them. I want a full face, full smile photo straight on. The patient's head has to be completely level. Ears, you could have them hold a tissue box up against the wall or the chair with their head. And then you, either you or the clinician, has to shoot that photo directly this way. Don't take it from the left or the right. Take it straight on. All right, so I'm gonna go through a group of photos and you guys tell me if they're good or if they're not good to import. Ready? First one. Yeah, no, that's not gonna work. That's pretty terrible. Next one. No, that one's not gonna work either. What about this one? That picture actually shouldn't be in there. Nope, not that one. We were talking about Padron. That's actually, a, where's Michael? That's a Padron right there, Michael. That's a 50th anniversary Padron if anybody wants to get me a birthday gift. I smoke a ton of those. Um, so obviously that photo won't work either. Nope, that one won't work. That one will. Um, so we're going to go ahead and say I'm a little cockeyed, just a little bit but it's not bad. I was kind of in a rush when I was getting these for you guys. So let's go ahead and take my head 
and import into three shape. We go ahead and mark the pupils, the midline, then size the ledge. And you guys could do all of this right now in three shape. We do this with almost all of our cases. And it is so helpful. Look at my clicker is, is time for a new one. There we go. Mark the lips. That's me. Let's put my teeth into my head. There we go. There's the design. And if it was bigger, there's actually a lot of things about the design I don't like that stuck out once you put them in my mouth. So super valuable. Here's a patient. There's a good, I'll let you take, yeah, get that. There's a good example. Uh, I believe this might have been a denture case, but the beginnings of a denture case, but we import them. Um, we do them with as many cases as we can. If we get a photo that we can use that's been taken properly, we absolutely positively import it into that case. And you could see, so there's some of the art team, but actually I want to show you this patient. We did a surgery on this patient with our surgical solution. Wow, she's got some serious issues, poor thing. Um, we're gonna do a ton of bone reduction on her to get her teeth back to where they need to be. This gives you guys an idea of what you can do when you're designing inside of the photo. All right, that's where she should be. So we're gonna go ahead and now build our surgical guides off of that. The photo was absolutely instrumental and incredibly valuable in making this case a success. All it was was just a regular photo, okay? We're gonna see what she looks like after surgery. That should be it. Here we go. There she is. Guides in, bones out. That is a ton of bone. That is a ton of bone. Just whew, slicked it. And there she is on the right hand side with the provisionals. That is insane, guys. And we just used the full face, full smile photo. That told us exactly where we had to put the teeth which then told our surgical team how much bone they had to reduce and how to build the guides. And that's an exact example of how accurate it actually is. That changed that poor gal's life. Um, so it's, it's, it's a really, really nice feature and something you should be able to use for your cases. You went from zero to a finished mouth with only a picture. No, no, she's not done. Yeah, no, she, no, not with just a picture. There's a whole bunch more that goes in there, but let me go here. Yeah, so she started here, and when the case comes in, we're going to digitally diagnostically design it before it goes to our surgical team. Then once we have the diagnostic design, it goes into surgical, and they do all of their madness over there, create the guides and create the provisionals. These are provisionals. Those aren't done. Yeah, those are provisionals, yeah. That's how she's going to wake up after surgery. Um, you know, they're going to build the guides, they're going to do the osteotomies, place the implants, all that, and then they're going to actually do, she's, I mean, coming out of it in conversions right there on the spot. And then we have to finish the case. So HD Plus, 4Y, everybody loves it. It's awesome. And I got to, Anton was saying it earlier, it is, Jeff, are we ready? HTML. How awesome is that? It's launched. It's a, so, in stock, can you guys get it today? Yep. All right, there you guys go. So it is finally here. Um, you guys can get it. I, actually, myself, am in the process of swapping us out and getting the ML. So we're swapping out a little bit of HT Plus for ML and uh, getting it in stock. I still don't have it in stock myself. That is what we're working on now, is getting it into the laboratory. I've had a lot of beta samples and things like that, so it's here and it's ready. Now, Jeff is probably gonna kill me for showing you guys this photo. Remember that place when we were doing that thing, we took that picture, we said we'd never show anybody? <laughs> yeah, he has no idea what's gonna happen next. All right, here we go. One more, uh, HT plus ML hybrid, okay? This is gonna be, this is gonna be my go-to for the hybrids. Um, and it's formulated because, you know, when you do a hybrid, um, like especially an FP3, they're massive, right? So Jeff and Paul and the team over there at Argon have worked on the formulas to 
idealize the color and the translucency for hybrids. So this one is coming. Can they get it now? Uh, not yet. <laughs> I could kind of put them on the spot. Couple months, okay, couple months. Still working on it, but that is coming. Um, so now with those three zirconias, it should cover everything that comes into the laboratory. Um, we are about, I gotta say about 95% zirk. We're super progressive. Um, the stragglers would be in that grouping, some lithium disilicate, like you said, sir. Clinician really isn't buying the zirconia veneer thing. No problem, what am I gonna do about it? Until research and data comes out. So we'll do that in lithium disilicate. And there is some stragglers of metal ceramics, unfortunately, I'd have to say. Um, I had a case, I actually didn't get the photo onto this presentation, um, but there was like no room. I mean, there was no room. It was a three unit posterior bridge on implants, no room. And I knew it was gonna break. I went ahead and made it anyways. Okay, let's see, guess what? It broke. So, <laughs> so that case will be metal occlusals and the whole nine yards is gonna be metal ceramic. Um, but there's not that much that I could find that comes into the laboratory that we can't use one of these three zirconias for. And that's why our, our production rate of zirconia, monolithic zirconia is so high. Because if it comes in the lab, it's going in one of those three. And we'll kind of take a look here. Um, I've showed this a lot when we're talking about what do you stain and glaze it with, what do you do, how do you get the character, how do you get the effects, we're gonna talk, we're gonna look at hybrids and everything, but I'll give you guys like a quick overview of that. Uh, this is Dr. Goldenberg, that's a acrylic denture on top. Dr. Mark Ludlow, again, all monolithic, because I don't have a reason to layer it anymore. We used to have to layer it because it was ugly. It's not ugly anymore, so we could put the brushes down. That's gonna be nice. Uh, Dr. Neil Starr, one is PMMA, the other one is Zirconia. The PMMA is on the right, Zirk's on the left. Dr. El Safadi, I'm just looking at some Zirk. This is a cool one, because it's rare that I get to go ahead and twist and rotate the teeth. Again, green stage finishing, this is where I apply my artistic license, is right here and now, okay? Um, then I center it and I really don't have to do anything. I check, I verify occlusion and function and things like that. Um, but yeah, I don't apply it afterwards. It's just, it just, you could damage your zirconia. There's a whole bunch of reasons why you could damage the zirconia first and foremost. You don't want to really post center grind. Avoid that if at all possible. Um, again, that's monolithic. That's the results we're able to get. And that's regular HT plus. And if it's FP1. FP1 is coming back huge, huge. Um, the same with like 80s and 90s style for our kids. I don't understand it. Um, I didn't think we looked great back then. I don't think it looks great now. Uh, but FP1 is coming back huge. And the thing, if I was gonna give you advice on FP1, is make sure you engineer it for success, okay? Because you're dealing with a lot shorter clearance on that palatal side, I don't, I don't do any separation of teeth on any of these cases on the palatal side, okay? I thicken it up, I go in the end, you go to the end of the design, you're finalized, you take the smooth tool or add tool and pump it in there and fill them all in and smooth it all out. It's kind of like a big chunk back there. I've never had anybody complain. I've never had one come back. But I could tell you I'm adding more strength to it, especially in an FP1, especially in FP1. If you're gonna break one, there's a good chance this is where you're gonna do it. So you gotta make sure you design it. It's not the material, it would be the design. I had this conversation with um, Dr. Mark Montana not too long ago where he said, in my practice, I do a ton of zirconia rescue. So, like, so I kind of question it sometimes. And I said, well, well what are you seeing? Well, I'm seeing this, I'm seeing that, I'm seeing breakage, I'm seeing tie bases to bond. I'm seeing poor aesthetics. And I said, so let's talk about this. Is it the material? Or is it the way that it was fabricated, both clinician and technician? Because it could go wrong either way. I said, so, so is it fair to say it's zirconia? Not really, not really. Because the way that it's fabricated, 
and the clinician on the other side driving has everything to do with the success of that case, okay? Mm, what do I got here? This is gonna be a cool case. This is with Dr. Jeff Canales. That's gonna be our phase two device. We're gonna come here and do the PMMA. This patient had some interesting demands. She wanted that diastema. She wanted the laterals rotated a little bit. So we'll go ahead and green stage finish it, give her exactly what she wants. This is gonna be post-surgery. We've already done the surgery. But that's what it's gonna basically look like. Then we'll go ahead and sexy it up, put it in her mouth. Not bad. I actually think she looks good with the diastema. I'm glad she kept it. Uh, this case is super cool. Ethnic tissue, okay? Super hard to do. Super, super hard to do. Um, again, all monolithic. That's pretty good. I would argue, it's cool here because we got these different pigmentations. This is an interesting case study. Um, when this gentleman was maybe about 19 years old, he had uh, jaw cancer in the mandible. So he went to UNC, they did the whole jaw in a day, took it out, put the leg bone in, put the implants in. Then he disappeared for like six years. They didn't see him again. They couldn't get a hold of him. Then he just shows up, back up randomly. He's like, ah, I think I'm ready for my teeth now. Um, so we went ahead and made the teeth. I can be honest, I'm, I'm light. I'm definitely lighter than his gingiva in the top. And this is as dark as I could get it. Uh, we have the cool different variant pigmentations here and there, kind of pick up some of that detail, lots of texture. Uh, but I was still light, and the reason why is for lack of a black shade. Um, and that probably would have popped it up a couple more notches, but it's still not, it's not a perfect result, but it's still a pretty cool result. Yes, sir. Ah, good question. To communicate, yeah. So you could use, um, I tell everybody, as long as you, if you use something the laboratory doesn't have, make sure you send it. Because it's, tissue is like almost all custom, all the time. Um, so there's like, a, even a Lucitone denture guide works. We have Lucitone guides we give out. Um, there's the old Ivoclar tissue guide, gingiva guide that's out there, that works. Um, if you take the pictures, as long as we have a reference to go back off of in the laboratory to look at the photo, to look at the tab, and go ahead and create a mix, and a mix not powders, I'll show you, um, that really works. Take pictures of it even if it doesn't match, because it's probably not going to. Tissue is the hardest thing in the world to do, all right? Single centrals are hard, tissue's 10 times harder. I mean, it really, it really, really is. So you take, go ahead and put in the model, take some photos, and then send that away, and we'll go ahead and try to mix it to customize it. Um, same thing, green stage finishing. Uh, I love it. Here's, this is old school. Um, you guys probably already have seen this case. It's. Uh, going to be a wax tooth set up into, and this is prosthodontics, so it has to be exactly the same all the way through, okay? So he did this, then we're going to go to plastic, then we're going to go to Zerk. And these, a lot of times, I just set them edge to edge for the photo. The occlusion's not like that. I just want to see the teeth from the top to the bottom. And there we go. Yeah, this one's kind of an older one. I believe that this was actually with an early version of ML. It was. Yeah. As I actually, and, and I, I, I did warn him that I put the hybrid Zerk in there. Um, normally I don't. I'm just like, surprise. Uh, but this time I kind of gave him warning. Oh, there we go. All right, that's nice. Nah, not bad. I'll take that. He was very happy. This one's super cool. How about that? Um, this one I actually don't have delivered yet. Um, I have done, so you guys could see it. I don't have it delivered. Uh, surface texture anatomy on in this instance, and know your clinician, right? I got a lot of guys that I can't do this for. And there's, I got a lot of patients that don't want that. Okay, so you gotta know who you're working for. But if they do want it, oh, by all means, put it in. Um, it is just awesome, and I do all of this in the green stage finishing. This has a little bit of everything. Um, primary, secondary, tertiary, stippling, there's verticals, there's horizontals, it's got it all going on. 
Um, so very, very cool case. Again, um, a rare treat to be able to do this. There it is centered. Ah, so we're getting to how I'm actually doing this. I believe we should be. So application of, this is gonna be go ahead anyways and, and blow it, Mio Liquid Ceramics. That's what I'm using for all of the cases, okay? So there's, there's your answer. I'm waiting for it, we're still not there yet. You can tell I'm a little bit rusty. You generally have like the whole thing memorized and I'm like, well, I thought it was already there. But it's all right, that's what I'm using. Um, this is prior application of structure, okay? And that's the application of structure. Structure's gonna give us our texture, basically. We're gonna get all of our depth in color in the shades, but the structure is gonna give us our texture. Notice I didn't put any on the teeth. I don't really need to put any on the teeth. I just need it for the pink. The teeth are already beautiful as it is, and there it is all done. Um, really, again, you can't beat the results that we're able to achieve today. If we go back, not really to date myself, but I would have had to take that case, I would have had to cut it all back, then I would have had to come back and put all of that information back on. Do you know how insane that is? Well, if we design it, it comes out, it's there, and then we're gonna take it off. Yeah, you sheet all your own Huh? Well, some of these ones I did, you could tell that I took some on white and some on black because I forgot I took the other ones on black, um, but we actually have some social media girls too that will take the photos. If I take it to them, like I take it to them in the morning, they'll shoot the photos and I pick it back up to them. Um, don't ask me about pho dental photography and there's real masters of it. I am not. Uh, it's a whole science. I say take a course. There's some incredible technicians that have mastered the art of dental photography. By all means, go see them um, because that's a whole nother obsession you can get into beyond the teeth themselves is the photography. Powdered ceramics are dead. Here we go. Now to answer your question, there it is. Eee, ugh, yuck. Wanna know why I know powdered ceramics are dead? Well, because Mike Tyson says so. And I'm not gonna argue with Mike Tyson. Are you? No, so don't do it anymore. Take the powdered ceramics and, I don't know, sell it on eBay or something. You don't need it. Wait, he's got a sweet diastema still. That thing's awesome. The, the tattoo's kind of fading, though. He was super, super nice. Um, he's gigantic still, but he's like my height. But my hand disappeared in his hand. I was shaking, like I was scared, like I was five years old or something. And he's like, you want a selfie, man? I'm like, with Mike Tyson? Yeah. Gingival ceramics going wrong. I actually, I collect these all the time. I'm gonna do a calendar for charity. Um, just go on Google. There's crazy zirconia images all over the place on there. You can find them yourself. And as always, I tell you guys, I'm super, super humble. I'm super blessed and thankful to be here. Um, I don't do this to kind of poke fun at anything. I just use it as a learning exercise because as technicians, if we see it, then we'll understand it. Um, if we see what to do, we can do it. If we see what not to do, we won't do it. Uh, so that's kind of where we're gonna go. Uh, graphic images, I've used a bunch of these for years, so some of these are probably definitely repeats for you guys. I got some new ones in there, and I had a bunch more new ones, but you know, we got ones like that. That's, that's an old photo I've been using forever. Uh, what, now here's one for the, for the layering fans. This one was layered. How awesome is that? Not so awesome. <laughs> He's laughing. He's like, yeah, it's not so awesome. Um, this one here, we got some really long distal extensions. Okay, so you know, um, safely, safely zirconia, because you're going to hear a clinician tell you, he's going to be like, well, what about my AP spread is great. It's not a matter of AP spread. It's a matter of um, material um, limitation. So in zirconia, you want to stay 10 millimeters distal of the most distal implant. Okay, so on this case, that's probably here. Normal setup would be one premolar, first molar occlusion. If you go way back into the all on four, the way it was developed and designed was one premolar, first molar occlusion. You could bump it back to two premolars, first molar occlusion, if the implants will allow. Um, one trend I'm seeing that has been massive right now in dentistry is people want more teeth. So, so all types of crazy stuff since the COVID. If you guys are anything like me, how many, how's everybody doing in their lab right now? 
Raise your hands. Great. Slammed. Don't know what to do with yourself. I'm right here. It's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. And I'm very thankful because it wasn't, it was like almost this same time last year, I thought I was going to be bankrupt. Uh, so I'm very, very happy for us for that. But I've noticed weird things come out of it, like patients want more teeth. That has been a thing I've been getting. I want more teeth. I paid for it, so I want more teeth. Um, due to the patient, due to the bone, due to the position of the implant, sometimes you can't do it just because of the limitation of the material. Otherwise, you'd have to switch to something else. Um, seeing guys drop implants back in, like Dr. Will Martin at UF in the implant center, uh, he's dropping in super short implants as far back as he can get them for that very reason. I want more teeth. It's been the weirdest thing. I've never had a problem with one premolar, first molar occlusion until you know, like post-COVID. Yes, sir? Could you do a tie bar? Yes, you could do a tie bar because you could take the tie bar out further and because it has a support of the titanium, not the zirconia, you would be okay. Tie bar, you would be okay. It's the same thing. So switch the material would be like an acrylic hybrid because you can jack that thing back as, as far as you want. Uh, here's another one. Um, this one's a board certified prosthodontist. And I just, I, he made that. Um, I wish he hadn't, but he did. Uh, this one's Armand Gerbach's on there, but it's this flange that just absolutely kills me. It gives me just chills down my spine when I see that. Um, and you know, sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do. Sometimes, you know, you're stuck and you gotta come down, a little bit of an implant exposed, all of that, make it as cleansable as possible. You guys know all that. But that, that is not a zirconia hybrid. That is a zirconia denture. And it's gonna be strapped to implants. And then, here's another one. Uh, this has got bar in it, but look at the flange. The flange is really, really bad. And I actually got the meat. I met him at Piers North America for the first time. I had a blast, literally the best time with him in the world. I think we were at the bar till like 2 in the morning with this guy, Dr. Tom Jackson. And he invented the auto flosser, which is the coolest little gadget you've ever seen in your life. But he just posted this picture, and I had to scoop it up for him. So see the implant right there? Have you ever removed a fixed hybrid and had the implant come out with it? That's nasty. That is nasty. And look at, look at the crap underneath that thing, right? That's what will happen if you flange them like that. So please don't. If you ever, if, if you ever do anything for me, make me a promise you won't do that, all right? Well, remember that. I could be dead and gone, and then you guys remember. I remember. I promise Jack I wouldn't do it. Don't do it. So now let's get to the Mio Liquid Ceramics. We'll start their green stage finishing. You could do it, you could not. Um, LMT, they just came out with the average cost of zirconia hybrid in the industry. And I think it was like 3,600. I don't know if anybody read that. They say it was about 3,600 bucks. Okay, I'm, believe it or not, I'm not much more than that. Because the materials have advanced, because of the great guys at Argon, I've been able to bring my pricing down because I have less hand processes in it. But not way down. I'm not going to do the race to the bottom thing. But I think I'm at 45, 50. I still charge for additional implant sites, stuff like that. So you could still end up at a good five grand is a healthy number. If you're in between 4,000 and 5,000. I tell everybody Glidewell does theirs, I think, for 3,900. So you definitely shouldn't be below Glidewell. And I get, well, do I have to green stage finish? No, you don't have to green stage finish. But don't we always want to take our work to like the next level? Yes, sir. What do you use for your finishing tools? Ah, we're going to see that. We're going to see that. So I actually have that on here. If I hurry up, because see, I'm doing it. I am behind. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go. I'm going to go really quick. So we'll just go quickly through this. You guys have probably seen this. I use this same little six units for everything. Um, I mill these out, and this is kind of how I train everybody. Um, you guys already know, but this is what all of these, if, if it's a single central, I'm doing this. Um, rarely do I actually use the enamel. So a lot of people ask, do I use the enamel? I don't, because if, like, if it's STML, I already have all the translucency I need. I don't need any more. So then I'll just apply the Mio shades. Um, this is actually application of Mio. So, it played. See how I tap it? 
tap, 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 tap. Keep hitting it like that until a little worm breaks free and then pick up that worm and put it on there. Remember, we're gonna get all of our depth and characterization from the shades itself. The structure is actually only for texture, okay? So I don't put that much structure on. There's not a lot of it on there. And you see, I just go ahead and, and pull it down. Um, with the structure, you could use water. I'm doing this upside down and backwards. If I look a little awkward and strained, it's probably because I am. But see, tap it, just like that. That's how you're gonna pick it up, okay? Flatten it out. I like to flatten it out till I get about a millimeter's worth of thickness. And then just take your brush and tap, 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 tap. And that little worm will break free and you scoop it up and you put it on. The only thing in this picture that's actually mine is that bowl. My daughter bought me that bowl. Uh, this is the rest of this stuff's all stuff I took from the technicians on the floor to make the video for you guys. <laughs> like, oh, look at that's a nice palette. Can I borrow that for five minutes? But that's basically what I do. Um, it's using the advanced materials zirconia that we have, and then the support materials which has really been able to, to give me my life stream in the laboratory, which has been able to do this. Um, another thing we look at is trainability, right? You got a new technician. This is a lot easier to train a technician than how we all in this room were trained over the years, right? You guys remember that? It was painful to learn powdered ceramics. We don't necessarily have those same problems anymore. We could use these materials and really, really help us out so that you can make more jacks or bobs, right? And our team, there's Yansu Kim. He made this one. He was very, very excited. He was so against zirconia when I first met him. He wouldn't even go near it. He was like cobalt chrome layer, full arches, awesome. I totally respect that. I didn't do that anymore. I hadn't done it for years, but I'm like, all right, well, cool. And then maybe about six months went by and he's like, he couldn't resist himself and he did one. Go ahead and try to get him to layer a cobalt chrome full arch framework and see what happens to you. He will absolutely refuse. And surgical, guys, I'm gonna go really quick through this, guys. We got our own surgical system. A lot of you guys may or may not know. Uh, synergy and navigation. This is a zero for the FP1s, really, really cool. Those little wings come down. Uh, scallop guide for Dr. Salama that we did right there. Uh, I'm gonna, that's gonna be FP1. So just be careful when you do your design. I'm gonna go really quick. We came out with a new one, though, this year during COVID. Now, you guys are all gonna ask the same really cool question that I want to know is how we do it and I absolutely have no idea. But that's a carbon fiber guide that we released and we purchased a carbon fiber printer, all right? I have no idea how it works, but the guides are really, really awesome. So now we make carbon fiber guides. So we have this in our complete lineup at the lab. That's to get away from the SLM guide? Yes. All right, ready? Integral scanning on all, in, ah, it's that rusty thing again. Intraoral scanning all on X in the restorative process, okay? Right now, it's the Wild West with intraoral scanners. I swear, if I would let them scan the chair the patient's sitting in to see if I can incorporate that and model match that in three shape for their case, they'd scan the damn chair. It's crazy. It's wild. I just gave this whole thing, this is what I did at the ACP. Put the scanner back in the cart and step away from the cart, please. All right, so I can tell you, like these guys, I can tell you that full arch, all digital workflows are coming. I'm working with Dr. Ludlow um, and several others. They are the masters of the scanning. All I do is do what they tell me to do, so don't look at me like I'm a master. Um, I'm just helping them develop their protocols by making the teeth on what they sent. It's coming. It's almost there. There's gonna be some stuff released later in this year, September time frame, um, that I'm gonna be participating in. But it's like this close. But until then, don't do it. We could use the scanner to gather bits and pieces of information to help us along the process. Like if you wanna take the surgical conversion and put it on the master cast, and instead of making a putty, you wanna scan it, that works. You can incorporate that back into your design file, right? But if you go ahead and you just go, I just won't, I don't even accept them. 
This is like a double jaw, with all the scan flags hanging out. They're like, hey, let's go for it. No. Uh, but I do know multiple clinicians that are working on the protocols right now, and they're pretty much done with great success, okay? So it's almost there. This Jack is going to tell you, yes, I am going to tell you no, okay? Trust me, trust me, you don't want to do it because it's just going to end bad. This is what I told, there was a guy at the ACP, he's like, I see all these guys doing it on Instagram, when can I do it? Can I do it right now? I told him, absolutely not. He said, but I see it on Instagram. Stop watching Instagram, okay? Because anything's possible on Instagram. Trust me. It's, I mean, it's cool, but anything's possible. So stop watching Instagram and know you can't do it because if I do one and it's a catastrophic failure, I could say that I did it all under the banner of academic science and research. If you guys do it in your laboratory with your clinician in private practice, that's just bad, right? So I am patiently waiting along with you guys to when we can say we can start doing this accurately because we're one foot in and one foot out, right? We're, when it comes to hybrids, we're kind of digital, but we're kind of not. We design them digitally, then we take them out, we put them on a model, we check and verify everything, or we make a verification jig, right? So it's, it's a lot different than, let's say, a 300 bridge, PMMA. Look at my A fell off. We'll go through this very quickly. I've been using Tempesthetic forever. There's more Tempesthetic, more Tempesthetic. Prototyping options, you can make pretty one, you can make an ugly one, make sure you prototype, make sure the patient signs off on it. This year I'm really stuck over here in this corner and it's freaking me out. <laughs> you guys notice like I keep wanting to go like this way and out and I can't. Uh, green stage finishing, okay, still number one question I'm asked and why, because it usually can or, you know, this is not a bad one. A bad one is one that I get that's a solid chunk that comes out. And there's some different things to do. There's you know the new C clamps and stuff. You can open face milling and stuff like that. That's pretty cool. Um, but still, it's very, very tricky. It's just the way that you're positioning in the block, right? Um, the way you have to for your interfaces and things like that. This one's honestly not that bad. Um, but it's when everything is filled in that it's like, no. That really sucks. So green stage finishing. Again, you want to do all of your contouring if you're going to do it. Um, surface texture anatomy, opening your abrasion, and sizal abrasion, all of that good stuff. While it's in the green stage, you don't want to do it post sinter. This way, we protect the material. Okay, because there is lots of studies on post sinter grinding um, that show that it is can be detrimental. Everybody's like, well, I do it all the time, and nothing's broke yet. Right. If it doesn't break in a month, maybe it'll break in two months, maybe it'll break in six months. Why risk it? I don't steam them, right? I don't apply thermal shock. Remember, it's a glass, it's not an alloy. We used to think when it first came out, it was like an alloy. We're like, yeah, this stuff is great. It's definitely far from that. It is still a ceramic. Uh, so let's go ahead and watch this video. This video is online too on YouTube. Um, depending on how we're doing on time, I may cut it short, but I'm gonna get it started so we go really quick. After all these years, still the number one question I'm asked all the time is green stage finishing a zirconia. In this video, which actually played for Lab Day Fall Online, I'm gonna basically generally show my techniques to green stage finish zirconia and the tools and instruments I use to do it. Hope you enjoy, thank you. So first we're just gonna basically talk about some of the tools and instruments I use Green stage finishing. I've been using Renford Brilliant Discs forever. They are amazing. Um, they cut really true. Uh, they're really, really nice. They keep cutting as they get smaller. So normally I'll have a couple of those mounted up. This is a Brassler Scotch Bright. This is just a number nine short uh, bristle brush and Dialyte rubber wheels. You've seen all these before. These are gonna be two carbides I use, and I'm gonna put the item numbers up for all of these at the end of the video. H42R, H42R, a flame, and a taper. This is HP Dent Yellowstone. This will do a great job. If you do have to adjust post center, um, you don't want to create any heat. This will do a great job of reducing without creating heat. 
This is a six unit. I use this, you know, quite often for courses I'm giving or lecturing. And we're going to go ahead and green stage finish it to get this result. Okay, that's kind of the goal. First things first, I'm going to remove the sprues. And you could do it very simply by just using uh, the large taper carbide. I use the taper more than the round end. Um, I just tend to prefer it. And I'm just going to go through and, and do a, a quick reduction of the sprues. I'll go ahead and dust it off. Once that's done, we'll be able to start our green stage finishing. First thing I do, using the Renfer Brilliant Disc, I'll cut into the incisal embrasure about a millimeter. Um, remember, everything that we're going to do is going to shrink. So even though it might look a little drastic now, um, we want to over-exaggerate everything. And I'll go for the incisal edge uh, embrasure first, then I'll go ahead and start opening up my gingival embrasure. You know, you gotta remember the mill gets us about 80% there, the rest is up to us. And then this is where you could actually go ahead and apply your artistry. The most important part of any uh, zirconia case, especially in the aesthetic zone, in the anterior six through 11, is always going to be gingival embrasures. Um, it is the make it or break it for a case. Uh, it's the part that really brings it to life. Um, compared to, you know, zirconia, it's very easy to get that kind of chunk, one piece chunk look um, if you don't go in and open up those gingival embrasures manually. And you can see here, I'll go ahead and start opening those up. Um, I'm flipping back and forth from the incisal edge to the facial view because basically if this was a hybrid, I'm looking for the screw axis holes and making sure that I don't collide with one because that would obviously be catastrophic and we'd have to remill our restoration. Now I'm going to come back through and I'm going to open those up a little bit more. And sometimes everybody asks me, how do you know how deep to go? Um, you know, I tell everybody when you get a little bit uncomfortable, you know, you can go pretty deep on these gingival embrasures and not have to worry, especially on a hybrid. Uh, there's so much mass and so much zirconia that you don't have to worry about that whatsoever. I'm going to go ahead and you can see I'm rolling the disc. I'm not actually cutting into the zirconia. I'm kind of rolling it left and right. Again, just concentrating on those gingival embrasures. I spend most of my time in that area. This is the flame and I'm going to go in and again, look at how deep I'm digging into there, you guys. I'm really kind of just opening those up. I'm going to accentuate them as much as possible. Now dust off your zirconia frequently. This way you can see what you've done. And we're going to go ahead and leave the left hand side untouched and just go ahead and concentrate on the right. This way you can see the difference between the finished side and the unfinished side. Now we'll go ahead and just give the teeth a once over, kind of smooth out any mill marks that may be there. And again, when I'm doing this, I'm not changing the design. The design has already been established. What I'm doing now is just bringing it to life. So I'm not gonna go through and say, I don't like this lateral or I don't like this cuspid and put my own spin on it. Um, the, the position of the teeth has already been predetermined for me. I just need to apply my artistry. Now I'm going to go ahead and use that taper carbide to remove some of that bulk that is on our gingival tissue. Kind of beginning to contour that in. Um, tissue has as much texture and contour as teeth do. And it's not just one solid flat piece, you know, and there's different styles and, and the amount of um, texture that tissue has varies from patient to patient. 
but it absolutely is there, so keep that in mind. Remember when cutting zirconia, um, the faster you go, the smoother it cuts. Uh, the slower you go, the you can risk, you know, chips. Make sure your burrs and diamonds and carbides, that they're all running true, your wheels. See, now I'm starting to define uh, the gingiva a little bit more. Starting to give it some texture. This is a good tip. Um, this is just simply a, a simple dolphin carver. I've sharpened that end with a rubber wheel and it allows you to, if you want, go in there and really, really create some nice, sharp, deep points. Separation between the tooth and the gingival cuff. Um, it it's, works really well, smooths out really well. I'll use this a lot of times. Sometimes I don't, it just all depends. You gotta remember fine, fine, fine detail a lot of times is lost through the sintering process because of the shrinkage. So again, if you're gonna use an instrument to create fine detail like this, make sure you cut it deep enough, make sure you exaggerate it enough, that way after sintering, your details that you applied are still visible. And we're really starting to come out nicely at this point. You can see the restoration begin to take shape. And of course at this time, it's you know the moment that you take to make this restoration your own. Uh, you could apply as much or as little artistry uh, at this time as you would like. It's completely up to you. Once you start working on it and you really start getting into the details, it's easy to lose yourself in your work and kind of just forget about time. Um, that happens a lot. It's, it's kind of just relaxing finishing your zirconia at this point. The more work you put in at this time, the better and obviously the less work you'll have to do post center. Again, just concentrating on some of those finer details. And you can see how the side we're finishing is really coming to life compared to the side we haven't finished. Now it's going to be surface texture and anatomy. And there's going to be three different types, primary, secondary, and tertiary. Uh, this is really kind of the funnest part, I think, um, as there is an infinite number of ways that you can apply that surface texture and anatomy to that individual tooth. 
Um, it could be how long you take it down the length of the tooth. It could be how deep you cut it in. Uh, it's really sky is the limit um, as far as what you want to do. I could take these six teeth and just by applying the surface texture and anatomy differently, I could keep doing the same case over and over and over again and it would look different each time. Um, it just depends. The length, the, the depth that you apply it, how aggressive that it is applied, you know, can literally give you an um, endless amount of possibilities. And this is what really kind of defines the restoration, brings it to life, and, and this is where you really have the, the chances an individual artist to shine. We'll go ahead and brush off our zirconia and take a look. In tertiary anatomy, there's broad horizontal striations, there's narrow horizontal striations, and then of course there's stippling. You could use all three, you could use one. Again, this is completely up to you. Just remember again when applying that surface texture and that anatomy to apply it deep enough and aggressive enough so that it'll show up after sintering. You can see now that we've really created a very nice individuality to the teeth. And again, depending on your case, depending on your patient, your doctor, you know, how, where, and how much uh, surface texture anatomy you apply is completely up to you. Now we'll come back with the carver. Just kind of smooth up some areas. The more finesse you do at this point, cleaning it up and uh, not leaving as many stray marks. I like to call it noise. Um, there's a difference at this point between surface texture anatomy and just diamond marks. The diamond marks are what I like to call just noise. It's not supposed to be there. It's not part of the tooth. It doesn't look good. Uh, in zirconia, it's different than layered ceramics. In layered ceramics, if you drag a diamond across a you know, layered porcelain after you fire, it's probably more than likely going to smooth out a little bit. In zirconia, it will not. So just keep that in mind. Uh, the more time you spend with kind of some of the finesse work and cleaning it up, not leaving it so rough, the better your post center finish will be. You can see how closed those gingival embrasures are on the side that we did not finish, and really the individual look we have on the side that we did. And that's really what brings zirconia uh, to life. When you're talking about full arch zirconia and hybrid zirconia, a lot of times you'll see that kind of chunk look and that's more than likely because after milling uh, the zirconia was just placed in the sintering oven to center without any of this finishing being done beforehand by green stage finishing it this is just like doing your ceramics or your finishing on layered ceramics but you do it before instead of after now we'll go ahead and just wear down our incisal ledges and we've put our wear facets on there We'll just use the rubber wheel for this. Uh, 
I like to use the black pencil to go ahead and mark the highest point of the incised ledge. That way, when I do wear down my inside, when I do wear down my incised ledges, I know that I am not shortening them. As long as the black pencil remains, I have not shortened that edge. This is when I'll go ahead and do a wear facet, and you can see how I kind of illustrated that. It's a push and pull up, and that will give you that teardrop shape. You will push the diamond in and peel it straight up, and that will create that nice diamond shape, that teardrop shape that is commonly seen with a wear facet. Here you can go a little bit deeper, thinly come across. Now let's talk about anatomy and where it is. If we look at a central, there is two depressions, mesial and one distal. On a lateral, there's one depression. And on a cuspid, there's two. On the central, the mesial one is gonna be more narrow. The distal one will be more wider. We can use a scotch bright. Scotch bright is, I mean, it is just, it's pretty awesome if you haven't used one before. Um, it gets the finish of the zirconia just smooth as glass within seconds. And it's very forgiving. Um, although it looks like it's taking massive amounts of material away, it's really not. It's just smoothing everything up. If you haven't tried one of these, uh, pick yourself up one and give it a shot. And, um, you know, in areas where you'll get rougher zirconia, um, it really helps in smoothing it out, and it does it very, very quickly. And it takes away the material you don't want there, and it leaves the material you want. And you can kind of see where we're at now, between the two sides, the finished and the unfinished. And we can go back and smooth some of this up. And there's a good idea of kind of the result you can expect. Again, look at the concentration in the gingival embrasures and what a difference that makes. Thanks for watching. All right. So actually, I'm not too bad. There's a signature art team. Um, I want to introduce you guys to this. This is the Mod Institute. Um, if you go to Mod, you have to go to modinstitute.com, I believe is the website. Use that early access code where it's going to ask you to put it um, first at Mod. The Mod Institute is the brainchild um, and the, the life's work of Dr. Wally Renee, who I was speaking of. If you don't follow him on the different social medias, check him out. Um, he's absolutely incredible, and everything he does is, is going to be digital, but then it's going to be research-backed. So it's, it's very, very cool. He's an awesome clinician. He opened up the Mod Institute. He basically took what you know, he would think were the top world's clinicians in different areas, and uh, they're all faculty. I was very honored and thankful and grateful and blessed to be asked to be a faculty member at the Mod Institute. So all of my education that I'm gonna do is now gonna be through Mod. It's in Charleston, which if you've never been to Charleston, it's one of my favorite places in the entire world. It is awesome. So you got a whole ton of things, you know, you can bring your wife, you bring your husband, or you both can come and uh, check it out because it's going to be the number one, I believe, the number one 
um, Center for Education as far as all things digital go. Um, my course will be called The Perfect Finish and we'll be doing all this. It's gonna be Aesthetic Zone 6 through 11, um, Mio Ceramics and how to do it. That's what I'll be working on there at MOD. And check out our social media. We have a ton of social media. I remember I said stay off of Instagram. I don't do Instagram, but I do have um, a YouTube. And so we do all types of random videos. Some are funny, some are cool. We had the Marines come out um, for Marine Corps birthday, Toys for Tots, all that stuff will be on there. Any new materials, techniques, tips, and tricks we see, uh, we go ahead and do a short little video and put it on the Absolute Talks. And that is it. Thank you guys so much. All right, just in time for lunch and the bar. I'm going to have a beer because I am done. <laughs> Thank you guys so much.